very good evening good sir good evening madam and good evening to all a yeah, warm welcome to all of you for this post graduation entrance test online coaching from our exercise testing and prescription organization and i welcome all the participants in uh, zoom meeting and i welcome our uh, team members uh, dr rupesh and professor duna now i welcome our resource person who belongs to my native place i am very happy about it because meeting a, a physiotherapist who belongs to the same uh, village or town always uh, gives a happiness and this is the first time uh, my native people uh, is uh, getting recognized uh, through this and i am so happy about it so with that uh, i would like to uh, welcome dr alagarasan assistant professor bangalore good evening sir. i welcome you sir thank you yes, sir. sir thank you please please come and session sir yes sir thank you sir good evening all so i uh, i think uh, enough introduction was given by uh, dr chandramogan sir uh, it's a very warm welcome by him i am very happy that i am from his native and uh, i am very happy to share my screen on this day uh, on behalf of uh, exercise testing and prescription and um, i apologize for the delay for the two weeks because of my personal uh, commitments and uh, uh, issues of uh, health issues and family issues because of that it was quite delayed but i believe it's a good start on this day um, and it will happen uh, proper properly in uh, here come uh, it'll be a good uh, beginning for us i believe um so i would like to uh, request everyone to make this uh, session as as much as possible interactive so that we not be boring uh, i believe everyone can uh, participate in a better way so shall we begin our session yes sir thank you so i'll begin with the question number 1 um, and before going into the uh, question i would like to give a, a clarification on uh, based on uh, the topic what we are going to discuss today uh, i uh, i have taken as a general topic a general uh, physiotherapy topic uh, it will be more or less it, it doesn't belongs to any particular uh, uh, particular subject of physiotherapy but it depends on uh, all physiotherapy management related things um, the basic things and as well as the uh, surgical oriented uh, things maybe comes uh, here and off uh, here and there so if there is any uh, question you feel as are confusing or anything means you can definitely uh, put your uh, comments on the chat and uh, let us uh, go through the things i'll begin with the question number 1 the first one so here uh, physical therapist performs an examination on a patient diagnosed with thoracic outlet syndrome so thoracic outlet syndrome i believe you all know what is thoracic outlet syndrome so during the examination the therapist initiates a special test as shown in the image which of the following would be considered a positive finding when performing this special test so here comes the image so this is the special test which could be done to diagnose thoracic outlet syndrome so if this test is being commenced on the patient in the sense what would be the appropriate measure to identify or diagnose the thoracic outlet syndrome so that's a question and here comes the options option a is inability to maintain the position for 3 minutes that's a question number i mean uh, option number 1 for the question number 1 and the second option is subjective report of fatigue in the arms and the absence of radial pulse after 1 minute is option c failure of the hands to regain their normal color after 30 seconds is option d so i believe you all understood the question to make a clarification i would like to repeat the question here i am saying that uh, the question is about the thoracic outlet syndrome and i would like to receive the answer from you people so i received one response 
from uh, Johar Maina, that's A. And Chirag also responded A. Giri Supraja responded A. And Abida responded C. And most of you people are responding with A. Let us see what is the right answer. Okay, so before going into the uh, answer, let us have a um, uh, thought process on thoracic outlet syndrome. So we know what is thoracic outlet syndrome, right? So it's a problem with the thorax and its alignment. So it may be having an extra rib on the upper side. So where the problem will be in the arms as well as in the thorax, the problem will be noticed. Okay, so when we exert this special test, any of these can happen and which is the appropriate measure. So that is the concern over here, which is the appropriate measure to diagnose the thoracic outlet syndrome. So the answer will be A, inability to maintain the test position for three minutes is the right answer. Is there any doubts in the first question? If there is any doubts, you can ask me. No, sir. We can move on to the next. Yes. So if there is no doubt, sir, I'll move on to the next question. Question number two. So here we are going to discuss about the exercise therapy. Exercise therapy, I think you all know about the principles of exercise therapy. In that overload principle, we are going to discuss. So overload principle is used to enhance physiologic improvement and bring about a training change. Okay, so we, if we want to bring the change in the training, I mean, if you want to see the improvement in this, the first ever principle applicable is overload principle. So if you do not overload the thing, betterment will not happen. Okay, so if you wish to see the patient getting better, the first ever principle in the exercise therapy is to overload the patient. Okay, but you must know how much is the correct intensity or what, what are all the things to be manipulated to give appropriate overload to the patient to see the pattern. Okay. So here the question is, which is the correct statement regarding the overload principle? So here we given four different statements out of which only one is the most appropriate, uh, appropriate uh, statement about the overload principle. And here comes the option, the appropriate overload for each person can be achieved by manipulating combination of training frequency, intensity and duration. That is the first statement. And the second statement is specific exercise elicits specific adaptations, creating specific training effects. Okay, specific exercise elicits specific adaptation, creating specific training effects. And a cardiorespiratory training effect can be achieved at a rating of somewhat hard or hard 13 to 16 on the original box scale of 6 to 19 scale in that scale. We can choose the 13 to 16 as a somewhat hard, hard to uh, feel a uh, self perception of the patient about the exercise. So that can be selected in order to achieve the betterment in cardiorespiratory training. And then the training level or target heart rate can be established at 70% of maximum to increase the aerobic capacity. So I would like to hear from you people. Uh, you can share your answers in the chat box. Uh, many are responding. Kindly check the chat box, please. Very good. Even I would like to request our YouTube uh, viewers, those who are watching online, can also answer these MCQs. Okay. So most of you have typed. Right answer. Okay, so the appropriate overload for each person can be achieved by manipulating combination of training frequency, intensity, and duration. Okay, so I believe we all know the science behind this. Anyhow, as a simple explanation, I can tell you overload can be given in any form, in the form of frequency or in the intensity and duration. So most of us may believe that in the intensity only we can give the uh, overload. So if so means, we may think the other answers also may be right like that. But here, we need to understand the principle 
we are asking the question towards the overload principle alone. So in the overload principle, what can be done to get the betterment of the patient? So in that, the appropriate treatment is this is the training frequency, intensity and duration can be manipulated as a overload thing. So here we can increase the duration for certain conditions. We can increase the intensity in certain conditions. We can increase the frequency of exercise in certain conditions. Anyhow, the part is we are going to overload the patient to see the better outcome for the patient. So that's the right answer. So third questions, we are going to move on the third question now. So here, aerobic training program can significantly improve cardiopulmonary function in the elderly age. We all know that. So which of the following is not an advantage of aerobic training? So understand the question is not an advantage of aerobic training. So here comes the options. Option A, improve recovery heart rates, increase maximum ventilatory capacity, that is vital capacity, reduces breathlessness, lowers perceived exertion, and increase systolic blood pressure. Can we get the answers? Yes, please try to answer. Option A, improves recovery heart rates. B, increase maximum ventilatory capacity, that's vital capacity, reduces breathlessness, lowers perceived exertion is option C. And the last one is increase systolic blood pressure. Hope many are answering in Zoom. Hope I, I expect some answers in YouTube also. I'm watching actually. If you have any doubts also, you can post in YouTube. So we could see the answers, a, a mixed response we received. Some people has texted B, some people has texted C, and a few texted as D. So here we need to understand uh, the question. So which of the following is not an advantage of aerobic training? So most of you people might think that reduces breathlessness, lowers perceived exertion. So these are all not benefit of aerobic exercise. See, we need to understand this is not going to immediately impact on the patient that reduces the breathlessness. Actually, when the patient is suffering of breathlessness, we are not supposed to give exercise. But within the limit, within asymptomatic level, we can prescribe exercises. So we can, pre we can prescribe aerobic exercises for the patient who is having breathlessness also within the limit of symptom, within the symptom limit. So when the patient getting breathlessness, that time we can terminate the exercise. Until that, we can prescribe the exercise for the patient and the patient can continue the exercise. So in the long term, it will definitely reduce the breathlessness and lower perceived uh, exertion also. Okay. So in this, we have to understand the significant improve in cardiopulmonary function. So overall significant improvement in the cardiopulmonary function is in that the long term goal, it's not short term goal. Okay. So in long term, when we consider about the long term one, increased systolic blood pressure is the wrong answer. I mean, is the not an advantage, is the right answer uh, for this question and which is a wrong answer for the uh, significant improvement in cardiopulmonary functioning. Okay, it's not going to increase. Systolic blood pressure is not going to increase. That's the right answer. Let us see the answer. Increase systolic blood pressure. So increasing systolic blood pressure is immediate effect of exercise. Immediately when we are doing the exercise, aerobic exercise, definitely an increase in the systolic blood pressure will happen. That's a normal response of cardiovascular and pulmonary system in the body. Okay. But in later stages, it is going to regularize the blood pressure. So actually, when we do the aerobic exercise in the longer term, that time it will benefit in lowering the blood pressure including the systolic blood pressure. So in that case, increase in systolic blood pressure is, an, is a, not an advantage of aerobic exercise in elderly people for a long term thing. So now we are moving on to the question number four. So here again, the principles of principle. So we all know frequency, intensity, type and type the principle. The equation includes factors that affect training, frequency, intensity, time and type. So here, uh, I think F I double T, so the spelling is wrong over here. Please uh, kindly ignore that and uh, correct it. 
So intensity is uh, interrelated with both duration, that is time and frequency. In this aspect, frequency is the number of exercise sessions per week, which is the incorrect statement relating to frequency at FITT. So less if the intensity is constant, the benefit from two versus four or three versus five times per week is the same. The first statement, less than two days per week does not produce adequate changes in aerobic capacity or body composition. For weight loss, five to seven days per week increase the caloric expenditure more than two days per week. And the Kavanagh formula is used to predict the heart rate reserve. Okay, so which is the incorrect statement relating to the fit principle over here. Kindly give your answers. Sir, kindly check the chat box. You are responding. Yes, yes I am checking, sir. Even uh, those who are watching in YouTube, you can also answer. Yes, sir. Few has responded. Someone is saying, I do not see the question clearly. Ruchi Gupta from uh, YouTube. Okay. So let us discuss the right answer now. The right answer yes, is yes. the covenant formula used to predict the heart rate reserve is the right answer, D. Because that is the incorrect statement about the frequency in the FITT principle so the question is which is the incorrect statement about the frequency of FITT so this is nowhere connected to the frequency setting of a exercise program is to predict the heart rate reserve yes but here that is not directly connected to the frequency rest all are connected to the frequency that's why this is the incorrect statement about the frequency of FIT. Did you all understood? If you have any doubts, you can ask me in the chat box or you can unmute your mic and ask. Not a problem. We can I'll keep the doubt the session at the end, sir. Please carry on. Yes. I'll move on to the next question. Question number five. A physical therapist working on an ICU unit notices a patient is experiencing SOB, that is shortness of breath and cough pain and warmth over the posterior cough. All of these may indicate which of the following medical condition. Patient may have a DVT, deep vein thrombosis. Patient may be exhibited signs of dermatitis. Patient may be in the late phase of CHF, that is congestive heart failure, and patient may be experiencing anxiety after surgery. So which of this is the right answer? When he started responding before we yes. announced the fourth option. So, yeah, the answers are, we are getting answers, the mixed answers we are getting. So the right answer is patient may have a DVT, deep pain thrombosis. So we will understand the question. So I'll, I'll explain the question now. A physical therapist working on an ICU unit. So where the patient is immobilized, okay. Notices a patient is experiencing sharpness of breath, cough pain. Understand this, this thing, cough pain and warmth over the posterior cough. So usually these are all the signs of DVT. Okay, so when the patient is having DVT, the patient may have pain in the cough, posterior uh, cough region, as well as if you touch and palpate the temperature, there you can see, you can notice that increase in the temperature, warmth over there, in that uh, 
localized area okay local temperature increase you can notice so along with that shortness of breath may be a confusing factor over here because in later stages it may it may become a emboli so and that may lead to pulmonary thrombus emboli in the large, uh, later stages which may lead to which may show as a sign of shortness of breath and that's a life threatening condition so when we are in the icu is one of the major criteria of treating patient especially the patient who are all immobilized for them at the early we must take the precautions to prevent the dvt so once the dvt is identified if it is suspected immediately we have to report to the physician treating physician and the physician will come and check the patient and if the patient is diagnosed with the dvt in the sense then anti thrombolytic agents may be given to the patient thrombolysis will be done and then along with that other measures also will be taken and once the dvt is cured i mean thrombolyzed completely and there is no potential risk of dvt furthermore in the sense then only our treatment will be begin if not the thrombus may become as emboli at any time it may dislodge from that area and it may be into the circulation and that may cause a life threatening condition like pulmonary thrombus embolism okay so we have to understand the first ever point uh, when you are seeing a patient in icu the important thing to see uh, is the risk of developing dvt in patients so we have to look for the patient and we have to estimate the risk first okay so how long the patient is being immobilized in the icu so depends upon that the risk is getting increased what are the medication the patient is getting so depends upon that we can look into that and then usually the uh, investigation uh, for i mean the assessment of dvt will begin with the observation and palpation if the patient is conscious the patient may respond to you that i am having pain over the cough region i mean over here in the back of the leg like that if the patient is unconscious then you can touch but you must you must be very careful because sometimes the test for dvt is squeeze test cough squeeze test itself will become potential potentially dangerous one which can which can lead to dislodge of the thrombus which may become a emboli and which may cause the problems what we discussed now so the right answer for this question is the patient may have a dvt as the right answer so now i'll move on to the question number 6 a patient is performing pelvic floor muscle strengthening for urinary incontinence pelvic floor muscle strengthening for urinary incontinence while practicing her long holds the physical therapist notices her abdomen rises and her face turn turns red so what he notices abdomen is getting rises up along with that her face turns red so what is the physical therapist observation over here so the options are normal accessory motion excessive posterior tilt valsalva maneuver and excessive rectus abdominis firing what could be the right answer for this question so option a normal accessory motion option b excessive posterior tilt c valsalva maneuver and d excessive rectus abdominis firing the answers are in the chat box sir kindly go to me checking sir I request you to be was also to respond. Yes. Yes. Excellent response. Most of you have said the right answer. I think almost everybody said the right answer. That's a Valsalva maneuver. So Valsalva maneuver. I believe you all know what is Valsalva maneuver. So here, the patient is doing the pelvic bridging, and meantime, the patient is uh, getting the response of. I mean, the patient is developing into Valsalva maneuver, which is a, which is not a good. good thing to do when uh, we are doing the exercise usually the valsalva maneuver will be performed uh, uh, during the time of uh, uh, motion sickness that mean uh, not exactly the motion sickness uh, constipation okay so during the constipation the patient may perform valsalva maneuver 
it is a, a dangerous one sometimes it may uh, lead to uh, syncope basophageal syncope on patients which may reduce the cardiac functions and uh, which may be a potentially uh, risk for patients who are having a cardiac problem already okay so this must be prevented so it is very much essential to observe the patient when the patient is performing uh, the pelvic bridging so at the initial phase when you are teaching the pelvic bridging for the patient uh, uh, that time you must observe these things and you must instruct the patient to prevent or not to do the valsalva maneuver uh, and you must make the patient understand what is valsalva maneuver first and then we must instruct how to prevent it and what are the potential dangers of the valsalva maneuver when uh, the exercises are performed okay so we'll move on to the next question question number 7 you have been referred a patient with a prescription that treats a knee strengthening open chain exercises only understand knee strengthening open chain exercises only so here we have to prescribe knee strengthening uh, exercises especially i mean knee strengthening exercises in the sense we are not going to strengthen the joint but we are going to strengthen the muscles which are all responsible for the uh, which are all connected to the knee joint okay so which of the following is not an open chain exercise so here we are going to have the options in that we have to find which is not an open chain exercise so the first option is knee extension second option is hamstring curls and third option is squat and the fourth option is straight leg raise so can we have the answers i believe everybody will say the right answer now for this question also option a knee extension option b hamstring curls option yes. c squat and option d straight yes. leg rise excellent as i expected everybody has said the right answer option c squat is the right answer because only in that exercise alone the patient lower uh, extremity the distal part is connected to the ground so rest of the things in all the things the distal part of the lower extremity will be in air which is which can independently move in the air but in squat alone it is in connection to the ground and which will make only the dependent movement in the other joints in the knee joint and hip joint it which cannot allow the independently independency in the knee joint or hip joint except the squat okay except the squat rest are all the right answer open kinematic chain exercise only squat is the close kinematic chain exercise so what you given is the right answer so we'll move on to the next question question number 8 you are planning the intervention for a patient with acute rotator cuff tendinitis understand acute rotator cuff tendinitis and subacromial bursitis okay so planning intervention for acute rotator cuff tendinitis and subacromial bursitis during your examination you found that passive and active glenohumeral motions increased the patient's pain so whatever it may be i mean uh, either it is active or passive glenohumeral motion both the active and passive glenohumeral motions are provoking the pain in the patient so your initial intervention should be to use modalities to reduce pain and inflammation to begin rotator cuff strengthening exercises to begin correcting any muscle muscle imbalances and shoulder isometrics so what could be the right answer the participants from youtube you can also participate yes. many are giving correct answers also for almost all the questions happy about it okay so most of you have said the right answer to use modalities to reduce pain and inflammation will be the first ever choice of treatment over here so in the intervention when we are giving the intervention the patient himself complains of pain okay when a patient suffers of pain the utmost care must be given to the pain okay so initially we must concentrate on reducing the pain and inflammation and later on we can begin the rotator cuff strengthening exercise
exercises and correcting muscle imbalances and shoulder isometrics all those things but initial response is to reduce the pain and inflammation so first of all we need to understand one thing over here why we need to give utmost attention to the pain over here in the sense when we treat a patient when we uh, assess a patient uh, at the uh, at the end of the assessment we are going to make a plan of treatment and before the plan of treatment we are going to list out the problems right so when we list out the problems that is called a problem list in that we will be listing out the problems which are all complained by the patient in the subjective examination i mean subjective assessment and then we are going to make the priority as well as we are going to note down all the problems over here including the objective assessment which we made on patient Okay, so not only the subjective assessment, but also the objective assessment we are going to uh, we are going to do at the end of the assessment after the investigation everything is made diagnosis everything is made we are going to make a problem list in the problem list we are going to write down the problems so in that problem list the first ever priority will be given to the symptom which is bothering the patient a lot okay which is bothering the patient a lot. for that only the patient is being here for the treatment to get the treatment for that particular symptom only the patient is being over here so the other problems which we found on the patient must also given equal responsibility i mean uh, uh, response but the first ever response or first ever uh, importance must be given to the complaint which is said by the patient so when the patient complains of pain obviously we must give that most uh, um, governance to the pain in reducing the pain and inflammation so once you reducing pain once you intervention use relaxation in the pain and reducing the inflammation obviously the patient will feel better and he will gain more confidence on you and for what he can do you, that is been achieved in the sense what else he wants so he will start believing you and he will cooperate with you very well so that your treatment will be 100% successful so you must begin with the priority when you are treating the patient that priority must be given to the complaint of the patient so the patient what key complaints with that only your treatment must be started so we will move on to the next question question number 9 the primary benefit of residual limb wrapping following lower extremity amputation is to so here we are going to do the residual limb wrapping so a compressing dressing compressive pressing we are going to do on patient to achieve what in amputation patient so the first one prevent limb edema prevent contractures prepare the limb for processes none of the above so what will be the answers yeah you two participants what will be the right It's, answer okay even if you are answering wrong that we will be welcome unless until you respond and select an option you will not uh, remember the question and its answer so keep on trying even if it is wrong that's fine and also our participants in zoom try to yes. answer so we yes. response um sir i mean interrupting sir do you want to continue your instructions no 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 please continue sir so yes thank you sir so the thing is uh, that we have received answers a mixed uh, answers uh, we received uh, a and c uh, mostly most of the people has said in that the right answer is prevent lymphedema next only prepare the lymph for processes is the last one the primary benefit understand the question properly the question is asked as a primary benefit of residual limb wrapping primary benefit so at the initial stage itself once soon after the amputation is done the patient will be uh, amputation is done the residual limb stump will be done with the proper dressing so once the wound healing happened properly immediately the compressive stocking dressing will be given in order to achieve reduction in the lymphedema or to prevent the lymphedema only after that only we are going to look for the uh, preparation of the limb for the processes of course in uh, before we apply the process also the patient needs to be wrapped up with the uh, compressive dressing so uh, that is also is there but the primary function the primary benefit of limb wrapping in the stump is 
to prevent the lymphedema and prevent contractures is the absolutely wrong answer at any stage the contra compressive pressing is not going to reduce the uh, reduce or prevent the contracture that's a totally wrong answer in this question and fortunately none of you said the uh, option b so the confusion between option a and c is cleared now i i guess the right answer is prevent lymphedema so now the question number 10 a patient rehabilitating from cardiac surgery is monitored using arterial line. So the patient is having arterial line. So the arterial line, what is an arterial line? In the sense, the purpose of an arterial line is to, okay, we'll discuss the options and then I'll explain what is an arterial line. So the first one, measure right atrial pressure, measure heart rate, and oxygen saturation, measure pulmonary artery pressure, and measure blood pressure. Can we have the answers? I read the options again. A, measure right arterial pressure. B, measure heart rate and oxygen saturation. C, measure pulmonary artery pressure. And the last D, measure blood pressure. So here we got the responses. Uh, it's a kind of a mixed response. We got C, B, D, and A also. So almost all the answers, are, all the options are given as a answer now. Let us see which which could be the right answer. The right answer is to measure the blood pressure. Okay. Let me explain. What is the arterial line? Okay. So. When a patient cardiac surgery is done or during the cardiac surgery uh, or after the cardiac surgery, the patient will be inserted one catheter, a small needle catheter will be inserted either in the uh, radial artery or in the femoral artery. Um, uh, sometimes other uh, arteries also may be chosen. The uh, easiest and uh, comfortable option is radial artery. If the radial artery is not uh, that intact or the bounces or uh, the, pulp, uh, the pulse is not, that bounciness is not there in the pulse or at any situation uh, where it is occluded or injury is there or uh, uh, any, uh, uh, any other injury happened to the artery, in that condition, they may go for the femoral artery uh, line, femoral arterial line. So that um, arterial line will be inserted with a needle, I mean, uh, with the catheter and that catheter will be connected to a pressure bag. Okay, so will be connected to a pressure bag where the pressure bag is inflated with the uh, balloon and it will be having one saline bag inside. And that saline bag will be having normal saline along with heparinization. Heparinization will be done. So then that um, pressure bag will be having the ports and one uh, uh, pressure meter will be there and that will be in parallel to the uh, patient's heart level and then from that, the links will be connecting to a monitor. So in that monitor, it will be showing the arterial pressure. So here, the primary function of this arterial line is to check the arterial pressure. So that is, uh, we are checking the blood pressure only, and this is the invasive method of checking the blood pressure. So blood pressure, we all know uh, to check the blood pressure, we always use a sigma manometer. Nowadays, the digital uh, sphygma manometer is there without the mercury. Just we need to wrap up and just press the button. It will show us the measure. And initial days, it was like uh, with the sphygma manometer. So you imagine in a cardiac patient, we may need to check the blood pressure very frequently. Um, and continuous monitoring is possible with arterial line because once the line is fixed, uh, then it is connected to the monitor in the sense. In the monitor, it will be showing the exact arterial pressure, what is, what is there. So the systolic and diastolic pressure in the artery will be shown on the monitor, which can be continuously monitored. So it is very much essential in monitoring the vitals of a cardiac patient after the surgery. So um, in that condition, measuring the blood pressure uh, Madam, Rupesh, are you there? Hello? 
Can you hear me? Yes, madam. Can you hear Kindly Raghunath check. sir? Chandramoon sir, you there? No, I don't. I think he is disconnected. Sir has got disconnected. No, he is oh, no, there. No, 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 he is there. Uh, mute. He has us? mute. Unmute, sir. Kindly unmute, sir. Now uh, share connected? your screen again, sir. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Yes, you are connected. Kindly share your screen. Yes, yes. Yes, sir, it is visible. Please continue. Yes, thank you. Sorry for the interruption. It happens, sir. It happens. Yes, sir. No worries, sir. The network is not in our hand. No worries. Carry on. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, the continuous and accurate measurement of uh, blood pressure is possible with the arterial line and that is the primary function of arterial line on patients uh, who undergo cardiac surgeries. So, the next question, question number 11, a physical therapist monitors the blood pressure of a 28-year-old male during increasing level of physical exertion, assuming a normal physiologic response, which of the following best describes the patient's blood pressure response to dynamic exercise. When we are giving dynamic exercise, we are measuring the blood pressure and in the following statements, which will be the appropriate and best description about the blood pressure monitoring in adult patient when he is performing exercise. So option A is systolic pressure decreases, diastolic pressure increases. Systolic pressure remains the same and diastolic pressure increases. Systolic pressure and diastolic pressure remain the same. Systolic pressure increases, diastolic pressure remains the same. Yes, responses are coming. You can read it in the chat okay. box. So we're getting the answers. Yes, yes, yes. So, hundred percent, we are getting the right answer. So, here the systolic blood pressure increases and diastolic pressure remains the same. How, when the patient is doing exercise, systolic pressure is getting increased, but the diastolic pressure remains the same. Why, in the sense? Here, the systolic pressure is increased because in order to meet the demand of blood supply, oxygen, and nutrient to the working muscles. Okay, so the working muscles are in demand of more amount of oxygen and nutrients. So here, the heart need to pump more blood to the, to the uh, working muscle. So the systolic pressure is getting increased because heart need to pump more. So when the, uh, because of that, the systolic pressure is getting increased in the arteries. But the diastolic pressure remains the same because diastolic pressure is measured during the phase of relaxation. So here the venous return is also increased, but that is not going to reflect in the arterial blood pressure. That's why it is, remains the same. The diastolic pressure remains the same and the systolic pressure increases during the time of exercise. So the right answer is, D, systolic pressure increases, diastolic pressure remains the same. Kudos to the people who said the right answer. And question number 12. A physical therapist elects to utilize six minute walk test as a uh, measure quantifying endurance for rehabilitating from a lengthy illness. Okay, so which variable would be the most appropriate measure when determining patient endurance level with this objective test. So six minute, six minute walk test, I believe you all know what is a six minute walk test. Um, a simple explanation I'll give about a six minute walk test. Uh, before that, we can see the options. So the options are perceived exertion, heart rate response, elapsed time and distance walked. So can we have the answers? Sir, while well, uh, we are waiting for the answers, you can uh, throw some uh, points about uh, six-minute walk test. Yes, sir. 
so six six minute walk test is a simple uh, functional measured test uh, which can be done on uh, uh, chronically ill patient or a cardiopulmonary patient uh, to check the functional capacity of the patient so endurance of the patient can be checked with the six minute walk test here the patient will be um, asked to walk in a particular distance uh, for say we can have the patient to walk around a 30 meter distance so here we can use two cones or something two objects to uh, to be placed on a distance of 30 meters and in one side from one side the patient will begin to walk and if the patient goes around uh, and come back to the starting point and then that will be considered as one lap so that is a 30 meter distance so in that uh, when we ask the patient to walk before he walks we will measure the vitals and we will document all the things and then we will ask the patient to walk in his own pace okay and we will not usually encourage the patient as stating that you are doing go to all but uh, we can uh, actually ask the patient if you are feeling anything any discomfort or any kind of uh, symptom uh, like uh, dyspnea pain uh, intermittent claudication any kind of problem if you are noticing if you are uh, felt in the sense you can uh, definitely communicate with us and uh, if the patient is uh, having any symptom the exercise uh, test can be terminated uh, uh, depends upon the symptom which appears on the patient okay so here at the uh, finally what we are going to do is uh, we are going to measure the distance what the patient walked within the duration of 6 minutes so within the duration of 6 minutes how much distance the patient covered so that will be checked and then uh, after the um, test i mean at the end of the test also we will be checking the vitals of the patient one second and then both the things pre and post test vitals if we are checking in the middle that also will be no, uh, documented and then the overall distance which is covered by the patient also will be documented and there is a normative data for the 6 minute walk test for a particular age group for this uh, high and weight person he can cover up to this much distance uh, without symptoms like that a uh, normal normative data is there so that distance walked will be compared with the normative data and with that we will conclude either the patient is having a good level of endurance or functional capacity or not if deficiency is there in the sense the appropriate exercise need to be prescribed to meet the deficiency okay so the right answer i think you all uh, came to the i mean you got the idea now i believe you all know the right answer now any of will see the right answer the right answer is distance walked okay sorry the option selected uh, is c and uh, uh, answer given is uh, distance walked but actually it is d distance walked d is the right answer okay so next question question number 13 a physical therapist performs Breath training with the patient on total hip arthroplasty. The patient has ordered for partial weight bearing. Which of the following gait pattern would be the most appropriate one for partial weight bearing? Understand the partial partial weight bearing, which would be the uh, best, most appropriate term uh, or most appropriate way to exhibit the partial weight bearing on a. patient who underwent total hip arthroplasty okay so partial weight bearing so the first one four point gait two point gait three point gait and swing to gait answers please so here we need to understand what is a partial weight bearing okay so the patient underwent a surgery okay so until the patient uh, the wound is getting healed stressing the wound part uh, will be uh, will will not be a good approach okay so in order to enhance the wound healing at the initial stages of the uh, surgery immediately in the post operative session the patient may be uh, instructed not to give weight when when the gait training is given uh, not to give a weight on the affected side i mean the surgical side where it is the surgery is done on that side okay so but later on slowly we must educate the patient to use the affected limb also so we must begin with the partial weight bearing that means a minimal weight transfer can be given on the 
limb. Uh, I mean, the uh, the side where the surgery is done, affected limb. In that limb, limb minimal weight bearing can be initiated in the as a progress. Okay, so later on, as a progress, we can in, increase the load on the side. So for that, we'll be using the different gait patterns. So in that, which will be the appropriate gait pattern is three point gait will be the right option. So C, three-point gait is the right option. Okay, so where the patient will be having axillary crutches or the walker. So with that, the patient will be moving the crutches or the walker as a one point. And then the next will be the affected limb. So where the partial weight bearing will be given, that limb will be given the next step. So with that, the partial weight bearing, the patient will be moving. See. When the partial weight bearing is given to the limb, the total body weight will be transferred to the assistive device. If it is a walker or crutch, auxiliary crutch, the weight, body weight will be transferred to the assistive device. Only a minimal weight, a 10 percentage like that, the minimal weight will be given to the affected limb. So along with that, the normal limb will be kept forward. Okay. So that's how the gait pattern will be entertained in the initial phase of partial weight bearing pressure. Okay, so for that, the three-point gait is the right answer. I believe you all understood. We'll move on to the next question now. Question number 14. A patient being treated in physical therapy uh, uh, experiences a syn <clears throat> syncopal event. Okay, the patient is getting syncope. A review of the patient medical record indicates that the patient has had both diarrhea and vomiting within the last 24 hours. The most likely cause associated with the syncopal event is, which could be the cause for the syncope? Anemia, <clears throat> dehydration, ortho orthostatic hypotension, that is otherwise known as postural hypotension, and pregnancy. So we started getting the answers now. So, yeah, we are getting almost mixed response. I request everyone to correlate the syncope with the patient condition. Yes. Okay. So here the patient had the medical record, medical history of diarrhea and vomiting. Okay. So in anemia also the patient may get syncope. In uh, Orthostatic uh, hypotension also the patient may get syncope. Pregnancy also the patient may get syncope. And dehydration also the patient may get syncope. But which is relevant to the past history of the patient? We need to co correlate the <clears throat> option with the condition. I mean with the question. Okay. So now if you correlate the condition or here the patient had diarrhea and vomiting. Both are going to reduce the water content of the body which may result in sorry sorry sir sorry you can continue sir yes yes uh, so both uh, the things may result in reducing the volume of the body which may be a dehydration okay so because of dehydration the patient may get the syncope over here so next one question number 14's answer is dehydration and question number 15 a physical therapist reviews the medical record of a patient diagnosed with the peripheral arterial disease prior to initiating treatment. Which objective finding would most severely limit the patient's ability to participate in an ambulation uh, exercise program? So the option A is sign of resting claudication. Option B is decreased peripheral pulses. And option C is cool skin. Option D is blood pressure of 165 bar 90 mmHg. <clears throat> so the patient is having peripheral arterial disease and which is going to limit the patient from the ablation. Okay. So we're getting almost right answers. Okay. So here we need to understand the condition. So the condition of the patient is peripheral arterial disease. Okay. So one of the cardinal sign 
of peripheral, peripheral arterial disease is intermittent claudication, right? So the patient may have pain in the lower limb. So that is the indication of peripheral arterial disease. So one of the most important uh, thing, symptom, which can limit the patient from ambulation is, ambulation is resting claudication. So when the patient is having claudication in the rest itself in the sense, with that pain, the patient cannot go for ambulation. So the right answer is sign of resting claudication is the right answer. Sign of resting claudication is the right answer. So with that, we came to the end of uh, today's session. I believe it was an uh, interesting uh, session. Uh, wasn't boring. I hope. Uh, really, I it, met really, the, it was a wonderful session. Clearly explained, and uh, uh, hope it is really useful for uh, the participants, those who are attend, uh, going to attend any entrance exam, also government exams. There are some questions in uh, YouTube, sir. I will read now. From Pratiksha, uh, she was asking about why not four-point gate? I don't know which question it is. She's asking uh, about... I, I believe that's the uh, partial weight-bearing hip joint uh, one. Yes, uh, options partial are there. Na? So in that, uh, why not four-point gate? She's asking. Yes, sir. So why not in the sense... The patient uh, have to maintain the uh, strategy. So different strategies need to be followed by the patient in order to maintain the balance. When the patient is uh, normally need to maintain the balance in the sense that different strategies are there. One among the strategies, hip strategy, ankle strategy, and then the oral strategy, right? So in that, the patient hip strategy is already compromised because the patient underwent the surgery, okay? And the overall lower limb itself cannot contribute for the balance now, okay? So when you are using the uh, crutches, you have to make a four-point gait in the sense, then initially you have to move the one crutch, I mean, it can be uh, the affected limb, and then the unaffected limb, and then the uh, uh, affected limb you have to keep a partial weight bearing, and then the non-affected limb you have to uh, take over. So number one is balancing will be a problem until you move your uh, other limb. So balancing with the uh, compromised limb will be a difficult one. And the second thing, energy expenditure will be more when you're using four point gate, energy expenditure will be more, okay? So which may make the patient tired very easily so that the patient cannot continue the exercise for the, I mean, walking uh, for the longer duration. So here we need to achieve both the things, which should be easy for the patient, as well as the patient need to uh, need to believe and have the comfortness in doing the exercise. That's why it's better to go with the three-point gait rather than the four-point gait. There is a beautiful message for you from uh, YouTube. Uh, excellent, sir. I have brushed my physiotherapy knowledge. Thanks, Dr. Alagarasan. Okay. Said by former principal PG College of Physiotherapy, Dr. Arun Balasupan. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much, Arun, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, actually, uh, you are one of my inspiration. I, and uh, for preparation of this uh, questions, uh, I did use your book. I ordered your book. And uh, in uh, Flipkart, I ordered uh, and Sir, your voice is breaking, and it was... Uh, not available now. I request Duna Madam and Rupesh kindly check whether Alagar Sansar is online. Uh, his He's video going. has got stuck, sir. Okay. Or disconnected. Yes, let us wait. And, uh, yes, sir. I joined again. Kindly unmute, yeah. sir. Yes. Unmute, please. Unmute. Yeah, please. Yes. You are disconnected. I mean, yes, yes, Thank you, Arun, sir. Uh, you are really a uh, uh, good inspiration for all of us. I, uh, it was really uh, useful. Your textbook only um, really helped me a lot in preparing the questions for uh, preparatory questions, which I shared with the group. Thank you so much for your uh, uh, feedback, sir. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, any questions, dear participants in Zoom, you can post it now. Uh, 
and uh, also those who are uh, watching it in YouTube also can post. I will read it here. So kindly check chat box. Sir, there is a question in chat box. Kindly check. Chat box. I didn't receive any question, sir, in the chat box. Okay, let me check it, sir. Don't worry. Sir, what does the diastolic pressure? When does the di diastolic pressure increases and why? Asked by Prerna Oja. Okay. So usually the diastolic pressure will get increased uh, in the patients. Uh, uh, it's, it's usually uh, happens with the pathology. Okay. So usually with the uh, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy or uh, when the refilling phase is getting difficult, uh, refilling phase of the heart is getting difficult that time only, the diastolic pressure usually will get uh, increased. So um, uh, actually, uh, the venous return is getting increased, no? So because I mean, the, that will become a problem, and after that, that may reflected in the uh, systolic blood pressure. I mean, in the systemic blood circulation, overall blood uh, systemic blood circulation will be reflected. Okay. So when we have uh, more amount of uh, refilling, uh, and that time the heart is having problem, and because of that, it can get increased. The diastolic pressure may get increased. Hypervolumia and uh, such conditions may uh, lead to the problems. Thank you, sir. Prena, are you there? Uh, are you convinced? Any questions you can raise? And from YouTube, somebody is asking, can you please increase the font size of the question? Already, uh, we have a better visibility, I hope. And still, I request, OK, we can go for, uh, uh, yes. we yes. consider that. And I'll we request you to I'll go uh, for a better device which you use, which have a bigger screen. And I uh, hope you will also uh, consider our request. Pardon, sir? No, I am requesting that uh, uh, physiotherapist who requested us to increase the font size. But yes. if we have a readable font only, it's not poor. So I request them to go for a better device which yes, they use yes. to view the, yes. yeah. So for the clarity of questions, all those things. It will be because sincerely they are watching. That's why. And uh, from uh, Zohar Maina, sir, why does diastolic BP remain same? Why di diastolic blood pressure remains same? That has been explained already. And here I'll explain one more time. Uh, here the demand is getting increased, so the heart rate is getting increased. So heart rate is also in getting increased. The pumping action of the heart is also getting increased. Okay. So when the blood is filled in inside the uh, heart, immediately that is pumping and the blood is getting entered into the arteries. Okay. So the systolic blood pressure is getting increased because during the contraction, it is getting increased. But the diastolic pressure is not getting increased because the heart is not having any problem in getting refilling. So it is getting refilled and immediately it is getting pumped out. Okay, so when there is a problem with the refilling phase, and um, if uh, uh, hypertension is there, then in that time we can expect the uh, problem with the diastolic pressure. But in normal conditions, when the patient, uh, when the normal client is doing exercise, that time we cannot expect the patient to have the uh, diastolic blood pressure increase uh, because that is not the physiological response naturally. Okay, so only the diastolic blood pressure will get increased with the as a normal physiological response of physical, uh, uh, I mean, physical exercise or activity. Okay. So the next question is from uh, another one more participant asking the question number 14. Yes, sir. The dehydration, they were asking. Yes, sir. Dehydration. Question number 14, they were asking. Uh, the question number 14 yes, was about uh, dehydration. The answer Maybe was uh, what is the doubt, sir, in that? Let me let me check it. Okay. Message has gone up. A few seconds. Yes, sir. sir and uh, answer the question 14, please. Is it dehydration? Yes, yes. Dehydration is the answer, sir. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Somebody missed it, it seems. Yes, sir. That's all. Uh, no other questions in the chat box also. Yes, sir. And, uh, I think we can wind now. Yes. Yeah, participants, uh, thank you so much. Uh, those 
for uh, answering for the MCQs. We have planned for a uh, uh, special lecture which is not available on YouTube. It may happen tomorrow uh, according to the availability of our resource person. And uh, whenever uh, we post questions to you, kindly take it uh, as a uh, work which may help you for your preparation and send us the answers. Uh, that's what we expect. Uh, so it is not that uh, everything is free, taking advantage and just be attending. Try uh, to answer those questions. Uh, uh, we expect that from you in return, at least that. So uh, encourage you, uh, those who are sending answers, we are uh, having special lectures. Okay, according to that, uh, availability of resource persons, we will be often going to conduct that also. Thank you for uh, coming um, and uh, thank you for all the view of uh, Ignace and Rehab India YouTube channel. And I take this opportunity to thank Dr. Alagarasan, Assistant Professor, for his uh, wonderful uh, work today. Yeah, really, it is a uh, wonderful session. Thank you so much. And I thank Dr. Rupesh and uh, Professor Puna for their presence too. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. I personally thank Good night. you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, sir. Bye bye. And, uh, I uh, thank uh, Juna, Madam, as well as uh, Rupesh, sir, uh, for uh, assisting us uh, in making these things. And uh, actually, you people are doing a great job. Uh, since I'm uh, following from the research methodology workshop, uh, I was really satisfied with that workshop uh, uh, Asisar was taking. So, I believe we can uh, join our hands in future. Uh, Thank you. So uh, it will be continued. I'm, I'm so happy. Uh, so you are already joined, uh, so that we won't leave you, actually. Don't <laughs> worry. <laughs> I'm happy to be a part of this. Anyways, <laughs> all are, actually. We are just team members. All the participants who uh, are here and uh, support us, all are here, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good night. Uh, all, uh, I uh, thank all thank parties, you, sir. Good night. People who responded also. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Sure. Thank you, sir. Bye bye. Good night.